many of you use a GPS? What does GPS stand for? Is it satellite or system? Global positioning system, satellite. It picks up from a satellite, right? And it shoots down to your little thing or to your phone that you've got and it tells you which way to go. How many of you have ever said, I don't need to use my GPS, I can find my way there? <laughs> and what happens? I get lost. Sometimes you make your way there. You know, sometimes you know where you're going, you don't need your GPS. Sometimes, like me now, I'm driving and I know where I'm going, and then the road's closed. And I'm like, great, construction season, here we go. How do I go now? What do I do? So you pop up your GPS and figure out how you need to go, right? It's our fail-safe. I wonder how many of the people here under the age of 18 actually know what a map is. <laughs> or the fact that a glove box in a car used to be used to hold maps, and you had to actually get a map out and look at it to read to figure out where you're going. But this morning in our re reading, Thomas says, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way, right? Jesus says that he's gone and he's going to his father's dwelling place, his father's house. And in his father's house, there's many rooms. And he's going to prepare a place for all of us. And all of us know how to get there. And Thomas goes, wait a minute, Jesus. I don't know where you're going. None of us know where you're going. How in the world can we know how to get there if we don't know where you're going? Right? But he said, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I go and prepare a place for you. And that is a promise. That's a promise that I have preached on many times over the years at funerals. This is a wonderful verse that I have used over and over and I've heard over and over again at funerals because it's all about the promise of what Jesus is doing for us. Jesus has promised each and every one of you this morning that He has gone into His Father's house and He's prepared, prepared a place for you. Not for the person sitting next to you. Well, yes, for the person sitting next to you. But for you. Not for anybody else. But there's a place in God's house, in the Father's house, for you. Because Jesus made it be there. Because we are sealed in that identity. This morning we're going to see it happen right here at this font. Ryan's going to come up here in a little bit. And he's going to be named and claimed by Christ right here at this font. And the identity and the promise of the fact that Jesus has now made a place for him in the Father's house is sealed right here. It's done. It's a promise. It's never going to be broken. It's there forever. Because of what was done, because of what was said, it's sealed. It's a promise. A promise of our identity and the fact that we belong in the Father's house. Like I said to the children up here this morning, it's not about the house we live in, it's about the love that we're shown in the house that we live in. It's communal. It's relational. It's why we gather here each Sunday morning, because we gather as the community of believers that are brought into the house of God, gathered together to worship in His house. And the interesting thing about this, and Jesus said this to the people that He was talking to, except for Thomas, obviously, because Thomas just didn't get it, it seems. But they would have understood the Father's house and the understanding of the Hebrews and the understanding of the Jewish people. And the Father's house and the dwelling place of a house is not a physical location. It's a kinship group. It's not a physical space at all. It's a relational communal system. Abraham's house is the kinship group of Abraham. It's not Abraham's actual dwelling place, the house that he lived in. It's an intimate dwelling. And when Jesus says that he goes to the Father's house and he prepares a place for you, what he's promising you in that is that he has prepared a place for you in an intimate dwelling with God. You get to sit at the feet 
to be held in the bosom, to be warmly embraced, to be held close and sheltered, as the psalm tells us, by your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus prepared for you. But Thomas hears it as most of us often hear it, right? When we hear John 14, we hear Jesus has gone away someplace to prepare a place for us in God's house, wherever that might be. And that is in? Thank you. Heaven. It's in heaven. And where is heaven? Up there. I heard up there. I didn't see anybody point, but okay, up there. Up there. It's not here, right? Well, that's a sermon for another day. (laughs) But Thomas hears it as a literal place. He's like, okay, Jesus, you said you went to your father's house and prepared this place for me, but we don't have any clue where you went because none of us saw you go anyplace long enough to go and prepare a place for all of us, first of all. And secondly, we didn't see you go, so we don't know where you went. We don't know how to get there. We need a map. We need something. Can you plug it into my GPS for me so I know how to get there? Right? And Jesus responds to Thomas, one of the famous I am statements, probably the most famous I am statement out of the Gospel of John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, 100% sheer promise. Jesus promised you in in the first couple of verses that he went away and prepared a place for you in God's dwelling place. He prepared a place for you in the intimate embrace of a father who loves you. And now he's telling you the sheer promise of each and every one of you already know how to get there. Just like Thomas should have known. Because Thomas knows how to get there. Because Jesus just told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way did you get to the father's dwelling place is in Jesus. That's how you get there. Jesus is telling Thomas that he already knows the way, and Thomas precisely knows the way, because Thomas already knows who Jesus is, so he can't possibly get lost. His GPS is pre-programmed, and it'll get around all the detours. There's no way that he's going to get lost on this trip that he's going on. But then Jesus throws this wrench into the equation here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, is that promise? Or is there something else? How have you heard that? I know many people in my life that are friends of mine, in real life and on Facebook and in cyber social communities, say that that's a hinge statement. That if you don't believe in Jesus the right way, then you're not going to make it. Or, if you don't believe in Jesus at all, your salvation's in doubt. If you don't do the things that God has called us to do, every last one of them in the Bible, even if they contradict each other, then you're not going to make it. Right, exactly. I had one head shake over here, which, you know, is good. At least somebody heard what I just said. So, Right, because there's things in the Bible that contradict themselves. And if we say we're going to follow each and every last thing in there, and that's what we have to do to make it, None of us have a chance. It doesn't matter that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But you see, that's not a hinge statement to be an either or, an in and out. Jesus isn't saying some of you are in and some of you are out. This is where context matters, because you have to go on. You can't stop at verse 6 here and say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So if you don't do it the right way, then you're not going to make it. Well, we've got to read the rest of the little part here that we've got to understand exactly what Jesus is saying here in verse 6, right? We can't stop there. Jesus then continues, If you know Me, you will know My Father also. From now on, you do know Him and have seen Him. And this is where grammar is important. Those of you still in school... Pay attention to your English teachers. They're teaching you something important. Because the way that you say something means something. Right? Grammar is important. The Greek tense here is not conditional. In this last sentence, If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Right? It sounds like it's conditional. If you know me. Right? It's not conditional. 
It is not conditional. It states an already existing state of affairs which makes the force of this sentence a promise. Jesus isn't saying, if you know me. He's telling the disciples, since you already know me, you know the Father, and you have seen him. You're already in that relationship. You're already part of that communal body. You're already in that dwelling place. Already there. If you know me and you do know me, you will also know my Father. Jesus' words here are not meant to keep people out, but they're an assurance to those who are listening to him that they're absolutely 100% already in. It's 100% sheer promise. It's not a conditionary statement to keep people out. It's a statement of Jesus telling them exactly who they are and how they live in the dwelling place of God. Jesus says, and from now on you actually do know him and have already seen him. Again, sheer promise. But then we get Philip, who says, Jesus, show us the Father. Right? They just, these disciples just keep on rolling. You see what that is for us is that's good news because when we don't get it, it's okay because the 12 that walked with him all for three years he was just doing stuff didn't get it either. So we still all have hope. Right? So Jesus says to Philip, what are you saying, Philip? Because Philip is the one, if you remember back the beginning of the, the Gospel of John, he was the one that went to the other disciples and said, hey, come over here and look. We found the Messiah. Come and see. He's the one that got it first on when he saw Jesus. He knew who he was. And he went to Nathaniel and he went to his brothers and he went to the other guys and he said, we found the Messiah. Come over here and see him. And Jesus responds to Philip who asked to see the Father, you have seen me and you really have seen me. Then you've seen the Father. Right? Philip and Thomas are caught up in the fact that they want to be in control. We want to be in control with our GPS, with our global positioning system. We want the control. We want to be able to say where we're going to go and when we're going to go and how we're going to get there. But Jesus said, I am. Several times in the Gospel of John. But each time that he said it, he said, ego eimi. And ego eimi is the words that was spoken by God in the fire. When God was first asked what his name is. If I'm supposed to go to the Egyptians, Moses said, and tell them that my God has sent me, who am I to tell them that I am coming from? And God said to him, Ego eimi. I am. Every time in the Gospel of John when Jesus uses the words, I am, he's claiming the name of God. And he says to these disciples, as God, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a physical way to a physical place, and not just any truth, but the absolute ultimate truth, and not just any life, but the abundant life that only I can give to you. And these three things are not three separate things. They are one and the same. It's a tautology. Adult, that's a new word for you. Go look it up this week. Tautology. Where you say something and you say it redundantly over and over again in a different way. The way, the truth, and the life are not meant to be three separate things, but it's one in all, where you get brought into the dwelling place of God, into the bosom and, and loving embrace of a Father that loves you. Because you see, it's not a global positioning system that we need, it's Jesus that each and every last one of us needs as the center of our lives to bring us into that familial, relational, communal relationship with God. He didn't... He didn't say no one can come to God except through me. He said no one can come to the Father except through me. Right? The Jews still have access to God because Jesus didn't close that door. But if you want that familial family relationship, the one that you get to sit with God at His feet and get held in that warm embrace and shelter through everything, the only way to get there is through Jesus. It's that communal relationship. It's that seat at that bosom. So rest assured in the promise that Jesus gives to each and every one of us, that he has gone and prepared that place. Not a physical place someplace far off, but a place that each and every one of us can dwell in right here, right now. And hold on to the promises that he's given you. Not worrying about what you need to do to use your GPS to get you to the places you think you need to go. But resting in the assurances of Jesus who already is your GPS, your God positioning system, who will lead you exactly to where you need to be at the foot 
and in the bosom of a Father who loves you and dearly wants to be with you.